Well, good evening, everybody, and can you hear me? I guess. Yes. <laughs> Great. Thanks for coming along, and I trust you've all been enjoying this fantastic exhibition celebrating the photographer of the year. So, just a little brief introduction about myself. Um, I'm a full time landscape photographer, so I've been selling my work of New Zealand landscapes through my network of galleries and my website for the last 16 years. And um, it's often debated is photography really art? So I've put together a slideshow here, um, so there's a series of um, shots here where I've tried to go into the background of some of these images and uh, also some short video clips, unfortunately I've got the sound, um, but I hope that will sort of give you a little bit more behind the scenes of what goes into some of these images. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully that will convince anybody that's not sure that uh, photography is indeed a powerful art form. Um, in this digital age, um, the fact that we all have a capable camera in our pockets is fantastic because it makes photography very accessible to all ages and abilities. But personally, it's, it's quite frustrating when I see on social media uh, this plethora of apps that can turn a very average photograph into a great, great one at just the simple touch of the button. So that's just one of the little challenges that we face because I know I've heard it before, oh, well, that's just a photograph. Um, but hopefully explaining some of these images behind uh, some of this will portray what's really involved. So if I could start with uh, my first image here, the Kaiseki, which is of course my entry into the uh, exhibition here. So this was uh, taken out at the Manukau Heads last winter. And uh, as is often the case, this is not what I actually had in mind when I ventured out here uh, early that morning. I was actually looking to capture the sunrise, uh, the first light. Uh, from out here you get a fantastic perspective of Auckland City with the various landforms and with Rangitoto just off to the right of the slide tower. But what happened is when the sun uh, came above the horizon, this fog just exploded and quickly enveloped the whole harbour and the, the view of the city was completely uh, covered which is when I suddenly just looked off to my shoulder and I saw this scene developing. So if I just uh, click through here, so obviously this is what we see here as a, as a frame piece, but if I just show you here, this was actually, oh sorry, here is the interior, but here we go. So the one that which I've chosen here is actually the third frame out of eight uh, scenes that I captured. And this was over a period of about 10 minutes. So the fog was moving quite quickly. And um, so I kept taking shots as I, as I felt. But it was that third frame which I thought just struck that the right balance and composition. Um, it's, it's quite subtle the differences between each one. But when I go back to the uh, image here, just somehow having that cloud at the top there just really mirrors the, the bottom. It's quite subtle, these little differences I find. Um, it drives you crazy some days when you're sitting there editing some images, um, but the devil is in the detail. Uh, moving on in a similar way, uh, this image that I captured, um, I called this the circle of life, again was one of those occasions where I, that was not what I was actually uh, looking to capture this evening. Um, we had a heavy bank of cloud on the west coast near Karamea with a very thin, clear slit on the western horizon, which I knew would um, mean a dramatic sunset. So I actually, uh, the next slide here is just a close up of this uh, the splash. It just shows in a little bit more detail. But if I go on here, um, Here's a short video clip that I took at the time of what I thought I was going to take. So you can see here you've got this heavy cloud and just a narrow slit on the horizon for, this, for the sun to squeeze through. But when I arrived out there, I, I set myself up on the banks of the river there. I thought the sun was going to dip below the horizon and light up the, uh, the river bank here, which is uh, covered in kneecow and reflect on the river. So you can see here, this is where I was, but then when the sun actually came down, all of this was in shadow. Uh, this area 
actually here at the river as by the bridge was in life. So I was like, oh, quick, plan B. So I quickly swapped lenses and sprinted down to the water's edge. And if I just go to the next frame here, I started to shoot, I, I just happened to notice this rock um, that was just above the surface of the sea. And I thought, oh great, I'll try and see what happens here. So I, I focused on the rock and just started capturing a sequence of images as the uh, waves were coming over that. And then uh, the fourth frame, which is actually this one, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth frame there just per captured that perfect circular splash. Um, and the next frame after that. So, you know, this, this image, more than any other I have captured, really, um, uh, oops, sorry, evokes that moment in time, you know, that, and I think that's the power of photography, um, to portray a moment that would not necessarily be visible to the naked eye. Um, so it's, it's quite powerful, I think. Um, this next image here, uh, which I call Tropical Tones, was on the Hifu track the following day. And I deliberately uh, wanted a vintage feel with this image, uh, so I chose this particular frame, and I, print, I printed this onto metallic canvas, which has unique pearlescent qualities and really great sharpness. Um, so I was looking for that period feel. And if I show you here, um, this was the original image. So this was actually four frames which I stitched together. Um, and you can see here, these are the four individual frames. By stitching separate, and rather than taking just one frame, some of you here may be familiar with this technique of where you can stitch together multiple frames, which gives you a much bigger file. Um, and uh, but much more effective in sepia than color, I think. Um, this next image here, beautiful bonsai, was up the Cobb Valley um, near Tarkica last October. I delayed my uh, hike a couple of days to coincide with uh, the forecast um, where fresh snow was going to fall. So I, I captured this little uh, short video clip. So I'll just show you this here. It was just, it was just amazing. I mean, that's full colour, but it's almost black and white. It was just like a winter wonderland. This is where iPhones are just so great just to have in your pocket and to capture these other images just as, as background shots. You can really tell the story there. It looks almost uh, oriental, sort of Japanese. Um, and then, uh, so here we are on the left, the same shot. On the right uh, was this image of the Cobb Hut, which I captured the next day. I retraced my steps back down the track, and uh, <coughs> I'd set the camera up, ready. I was just waiting for the sun to come out, and just as the sun burst through some cloud, this little wecker happened to uh, walk into view. So, you know, and I think it's it's just so great if you can capture, if you can add those little details. Um, you know, without the wecker it would still be a lovely little cute hut, but just having that extra detail. So I called this one Wicked Wecker. Um, that morning when I was staying at Vanilla Hut, there was uh, a young family and uh, one of the young boys uh, had his boots outside, um, just on the veranda, and um, I was up on my bunk uh, at the time, and I just heard these yells and screams um, because this wecker had picked up this boy's boot and was running into the bushes. <laughs> so they were like, quench, you know. And uh, they managed to, um, you know, the, the, I think the wecker dropped the boot, fortunately. It had been a long, uh, long four-hour walk out with one boot, so hence the name Wicked Wecker. Uh, the next image here, this sheep in, in the apple orchard down in Roxburgh has been a popular print, um, but this was just before, I managed to capture this just before the dog barking forward at all, and then <laughs> this uh, one on the right of uh, Jersey cows coming out of the, uh, the milking shed in the morning. Um, you know, a lot of these images, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. 
This uh, image here, which I call Bonjour Akira, um is a bit of a classic um, of mine. Um, but I had, to get, I had to get quite cunning to capture this. Um, so the next, pro next slide here, um, this was uh, this little one down here in the left corner. I had a, a friend of mine, Simon, along for the trip, and um, Simon's mum, uh, we call her Auntie Di, um, makes the best chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> and we had, and when we arrived uh, at the pier this morning, saw the oh great goals on this on the pier. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, but of course, we had to wait some time for the sun to rise. So I said to Simon, okay, we've got any cookies left. So we had four, four of the best chocolate chip cookies, which Simon or Julie uh, broke into crumbs and the rations were all on the rolling to keep the girls there, um, just a bit of a bribe. Um, and then um, the, there was, there's always one bossy girl, and uh, I've pointed him out here, I think that's him there. So he, he was... Uh, he wanted, all the, he wanted all the cookies to himself and kept showing the gulls away. But then just as the light was right and the gulls settled down for what seemed like just a couple of seconds, this guy just on the, on the right, on the third frame there, he had said good day as he was going out earlier, he just happened to be rowing back ashore at the same time. Um, and then unbeknownst to me, Simon catched a shot of me actually shooting the gulls. And there on the bottom right, uh, as the sun got higher, of course, the, the light changes so quickly. So you've just got to really think on your feet and work so quickly. Um, and here it is. Um, I got sent this image on the left uh, from a client in the UK who had uh, taken the canvas back home, rolled up loose, and she framed it in a white frame. And then this was in a show home in Caracas a few years ago. In the black. This uh, this next image here, um, bon uh, Bonjour Ecoro, that last one is just about sold out now. So uh, the gallery that I have at Little River on the way out to Ecoro, uh, I needed something fresh uh, for the gallery there. So I went back to the area this July and. Um, came across this wharf at Wainui, which is on the opposite side of the harbour to Akaroa. You can see Akaroa here in the distance. So when I arrived here, I thought, oh, great guns again. Um, the seagulls were lined up on the railing, waiting for the fishing boat to return. So I captured five uh, separate frames, which I stitched together um, to create this. But, and here it is here, so this is printed onto metallic canvas, um, again, which really, with the silver tones, it really uh, reflects. It's got some awesome properties. And this is mounted in a, with a silver fillet inside a, a white mesh frame. Now, the choice of framing can really turn uh, a photograph into a piece of art. And here it is here, uh, superimposed on the, in the interior. This next image here is uh, a before shot of um, Kaikoura. I've been wanting to get a really great, unique sunrise image of Kaikoura for many years. So this was, I think, two years ago. And when I woke and look at, woke up and looked outside and saw these clouds forming, I thought, oh, hooray, this could be good. I got excited. So, I got down here to the foreshore, and um, initially it didn't, I didn't think that these were really going to colour up. It was taking ages, and it looked like only the clouds in the distance were going to turn colour. But as they say, patience is a virtue, and 17 minutes later, uh, Starburst. Um, and I've got a, um, just to prove it's for real, I've got a video clip <laughs> off my phone. Um, oh, sorry, before we do that. Um, I checked the forecast at the time and it said, some clouds. Yeah, some clouds are all right. <laughs> so this little clip here, so you've got to excuse the exposure being a little bit light um, with your phone, but um, another interesting thing to note here is the fact that 
after I got the shots, I checked the tide chart, and this was actually only two hours before high tide. And this was, of course, after the earthquake, where a lot of the seabed, seabed was lifted up to two metres in parts. So pre-earthquake, all of these rocks would have been underwater at that, at, under these conditions. So, uh, but the symmetry of the rocks with the clouds is quite extraordinary. Going from a dramatic sunrise to a sunset now, this was, a, this was uh, Mount Narahori at National Park a few months ago. Um, the, that day had been really quite nasty weather uh, all day, but um, that morning I um, checked the forecast and um, you know, you've really got to be, um, you've got to have a crystal ball sometimes, but really understand the weather patterns um, as well. Um, just to seek out those opportunities. And this was, I think, the forecast how it was going to look for six o'clock. So, you, you know, to get that dramatic colour, you actually want cloud, but you need a bit of, bit of clear light on the horizon for that light just to penetrate. Um, so, I've got a video clip here, which, let me play that. So, this was, uh, I've zoomed in quite close on the camera but quite extraordinary. But this went from grey skies and rain to this in less than 90 minutes. Um, so, you know, it, it, everything changes so quickly. This image here, Dancing Mist, it was actually rain I was particularly looking for um, to bring these vertical cliffs near the Homer Tunnel uh, on the road to Milford Town <coughs> alive. Uh, and this is a large composite file which I've stitched together like a big jigsaw puzzle is the best way to describe it. So there's 20 separate frame, uh, 20 separate telephoto images which I've stitched together to create one large file. Um, but the weather forecast at the time looked pretty terrible, so I thought, great, uh, let's go. And uh, it, it predicted it was going to clear about one o'clock, and this was a quick snap on my phone at the time, it was just starting to lift. Uh, here are, so these are four of the 20 separate individual frames. And when you've got, you know, such a big file, uh, that enables you to really uh, display that detail um, at great sizes. You know, it's, it's quite beautiful when you've got the water uh, sort of just splashing off the rocks and the light, you know, the sun was just coming out and just, just reflecting off the surface of the rock it was, it was quite awesome. Uh, but again, when you've got those big files, that allows you to go back. Uh, here it is at the top left on a um, print of the glass in a shower in Queenstown um, in the Strike Lounge at Auckland International Airport. Um, a, a laundry splashback in Christchurch. <coughs> this is on a, as a canvas triptych, uh, two metres high, and then the bottom right was um, that's in a home in Devonport where the canvas is uh, uh, maybe four and a half metres high. Another large uh, series of works I did for the Auckland International Airport. Uh, this image of Castle Hill uh, has been printed onto fabric. And that stands four metres high by 19 metres wide uh, at gate 17 in the departures terminal. Unfortunately, of course, not many of us can see that these days, but um, I've got a video clip here. This was at sunrise. Um, it was quite a mission to get this, but here's this sort of gives you a better idea. It's difficult to really um, portray how cool this looks when you see it for real. It's quite amazing. Um, but this was quite a tricky image to shoot. The light was changing on me a little bit. I'm shooting four frames high by 13 wide, so 52 frames total. And the, the, uh, as the sun was rising, it hit some cloud, and that became a bit of a mission to bring it together. Um, Another large composite, this, at, uh, this is in one of the bathrooms in the security pool at, at uh, the airport. Uh, this was an ancient Furukawa at sunrise, 
uh, Peter Bay on the Coromandel. Uh, and similarly, this was four frames high by seven wide. Um, I'm currently working on uh, a section of this image that's being installed in a few weeks' time at a retirement village um, near Oriwa. So when you've got these big files, you can do big things. It's quite exciting. But of all these large composite files, I've uh, pulled off this particular one uh, at Lake Pukaki was by far the most complex. This is a client's indoor pool in Russia. Um, I was contacted one year by this photo agent. Uh, he had this client that was uh, completing his big home and he spends a bit of time here in New Zealand. And um, he wanted uh, an alpine lake scene with um, autumn leaves, he wanted pink fluffy clouds, and I said, you can forget your pink fluffy clouds, no one is going to be involved. Um, so, anyway, I didn't, we, we exchanged a few emails, I didn't hear any more, and then the following year he contacted me again, uh, this home was complete, and we had a big black wall, this is 28 metres wide by 3 metres high. So, this particular scene, so I went off in search of, and um, I ended up shooting this as a 180 degree view, which I first captured in, at the uh, end of April in the autumn. Uh, but when I shot that, all of these, the Alps to the left of Mount Cook were all bare. And exchanging, e uh, exchanging emails backwards and forwards with um, a client who wanted more snow-capped mountains. So I said, okay. <laughs> Um, how about I go back in winter and reshoot it again? So I did that. I went back in July, reshot everything again, uh, and then I had the unenviable task of then um, putting all these autumn leaves back onto the bare trees. Um, <laughs> so I go back here. So what you see here, the reflections, the, the snow is all. Uh, in winter, that was all July, and um, the leaves, of course, you know, these, this tree here would have been bare, and I had to copy all the leaves back onto the same trees. This was the before shot that he took of the bare wall. Um, but of course, this was all, this was um, four frames high by 30 frames wide, so 120 frames. Um, and doing that process, I also had to repair not only replace the leaves onto the trees, but the, um, the patterns for the ripples, he was very particular. Um, I mean, he was paying a lot of money, granted, but the, the ripples, what was happening, with, if you imagine carving that into 120 sections, when you go from one column to the next, by the time you get there, the wind has changed the shape of the, of the reflections. So when you go to stitch it together, they don't join. So it was, all in all, it was a process. I sat there for about three weeks, repairing, putting the leaves back, repairing the, uh, the reflections. Uh, and in the end, we got there, and uh, he was happy. So that was good. <laughs> um, but the same morning um, that I shot the autumn leaf version, I um, came further down the shores of Lake Pukaki and I was looking for any hidden little pockets of water where there might be some sneaky reflections of Mount Cook. So I went down this random track and um, a tree had fallen over the road. So I stopped at that point and got out, had a look, and there was all these toadstools under the trees covered with these leaves. I thought, oh cool, great. So I spent about half an hour taking pictures of these, and then of course I, I couldn't go forward, I had to back up the same track, and in that 30 minutes that had lapsed, the sun had now risen, and this tree, when I'd driven past it previously, was all in shadow, and now all of a sudden, boom, it was alive. Um, just stunning. So, I call this um, Raining Jewels, and here it is, uh, enlarged uh, two meters wide, on canvas in a couple of autumn homes. You know, it was such vibrant colour, it's been a, a popular statement piece. <laughs>